Hi there. My name is Jessica Crow, and I am the founder of Apogee and host of Change Leader Insights, which is a podcast where I get to interview business executives, community leaders, academics, experts who are uh, focused on implementing change, how they make decisions, how they activate change. And today's guest is Tiffany Bray. Tiffany, thank you so much for being here. It's so nice to have you. Tiffany is a vice president with Path Mental Health, which was uh, recently named one of LinkedIn's 2020 top startup. So this is very exciting to have her on the show today. Tiffany, um, do you mind just giving a little bit of a bio about yourself, kind of who you are, where you work, what you do, and then I'll I've got some questions for you. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks for having me. I'm excited to engage in this conversation today. Um, by way of, way of background, I'm a 20 plus year veteran in the healthcare space. I got my career starting as a process improvement uh, quality engineer, and I remember Jess, you and I met uh, in the change with a passion around change management back in the day. Yeah. Um, and but I've uh, leading change is near and dear to my heart, and I'm excited again to to have the conversation today. Currently, as you mentioned, I am focused on growth in the behavioral health space. It's a really booming space right now, meeting some pretty intense needs. And I'm specifically focused on building processes with health systems um, to help them access high quality mental health resources that they may not be able to access within their own systems internally and need to go external for that support. And ultimately, really, our goal is to improve patient outcomes and quality of life. Yeah, well, your organization is lucky to have you. I should have mentioned when I did the intro that you and I did work together many moons ago. And mm -hmm. while I wasn't fortunate enough to work on your team, I did get to see your path, all of the accomplishments uh, that you and your team made while you were at the organization where we were working. So um, Path is very lucky to have you. And I have no doubt you're going to be doing and continuing to do really big things there. Um, the reason I wanted to talk with you today is because change is challenging. Change in healthcare is especially challenging. You mentioned mental health uh, and, and advocating and how do we get access to patients and provide great patient care. Very challenging. So I wanted to just ask you a, a little bit about the trends that you're seeing as it relates to challenges, opportunities in the healthcare space, as it relates to mental health in particular. Yeah. Yeah. Let me start maybe by painting the picture of the problem that we're facing in mental health yeah. behavior today. So a couple of statistics for you. In every, any given year, 21% of adults need mental health care, and over half of them actually go without accessing any sort of support. Mm -hmm. This one scares me because I have a teenage daughter. Three in five teenage girls today feel persistently sad. Mm -hmm. And 22% uh, of high school students have contemplated suicide in the past year. You know, again, I'm a parent of teens. Um, this is near and dear to my heart right now, and it's really frightening. Um, what they're going through. And so beyond that, you know, we talked about, or I mentioned people who are uh, needing the resources, but not being able to access them. Generally, people will try to find resources, maybe through their insurance. And so they go through the process of, you know, reaching out to therapists, find out that they don't take insurance, they'll go right. to their um, health plans provider directory and see if they can find someone in network and lo and behold there's not very many people and those who are have closed panels and are no longer seeing people so it's just um, a yeah. constant challenge to try and find these resources and I can tell you from my own experience you know trying to go outside of the insurance plans and find those resources on my own for my family what I found was I called a dozen different therapists providers and maybe one of them called me back. Mm -hmm. And the one that did call me back was kind enough to tell me that they had a six month wait list. So it's just Doesn't super help. challenging yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to find anyone to, to work with these days. And so that's, that's, I think the uphill battle that a lot of people really face. Yeah. And so, so yeah, well, I was going to say, so your company is really tackling a, a big challenge, a, a, you know, a, a big problem that needs to be solved for, but there's so many layers. It, it's not as easy as hiring more counselors, therapists, psychologists. Can you help 
my, you know, the community that's listening to this conversation understand what are some of those nuances that make change in healthcare so um, multifaceted, we'll say, in, yeah. in terms of tackling. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, challenge change is challenging for everyone. You know, no one really likes to change. Um, I think, though, from a healthcare perspective, it's compounded by the fact that you've got a very complex regulatory environment. Yeah. So you're talking about federal government, state government, and every organization working to meet those requirements, which sometimes are in concert, sometimes are conflicting. Mm -hmm. um, and with mental health in particular, then you also have HIPAA, which is your pa patient privacy, but then also SAMHSA, which is Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Mm -hmm. So you add another regulatory body into the mix. And as a result, you just got a lot of complication and a lot of bureaucracy to work through when you're trying to affect change in this space. Mm -hmm. And, you know, healthcare in general is notoriously slow um, mm -hmm. compared to other industries when you think about making change. But I can tell you that there are many different things working in concert to bring awareness to this problem and try and resolve it. So, mm -hmm. you know, from the government's perspective, they are bringing awareness The the um, Surgeon General in 2021 highlighted how devastating the impact of mental health has been on the young community, the, the child and adolescents. Um, just this past week, uh, President Biden has allocated $200 million in funding grant funding specifically to support youth mental health. Mm -hmm. And there's also policy work underway to attempt to close loopholes that exist um, whereby uh, insurers today don't necessarily have to provide adequate coverage and access for mental health providers. And so working to close those loopholes so that there's the same access for mental health as there is for physical health. So there is a lot of work underway from a governmental perspective to work to close some of these gaps and uh, and help make access more accessible. Which is really exciting. I mean, there's there's obviously stigmas around mental health and people being willing to um, admit or uh, uh, pursue services and all the challenges that you just described, I mean, kind of makes the whole problem, it compounds it. So um, with the, you know, the Biden administration offering grants, do you think that, you know, change here is going to have to come in, in multiple formats, multi-pronged approach, not only from government, regulatory, but also there has to be something, some something else, right? Whether it's um, advocacy, whether it's uh, apps, like what do you think is a good, you know, where do you see the future of, of health, mental health services headed? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. And I think, I, I guess there's a couple areas I would highlight for you. The first one's really personal for, for me because, again, I mentioned I've got teenage kids. I think the power of a grassroots effort can mm -hmm. be so impactful. Um, my son last week was at a retreat up in the mountains with a group of other um, high schoolers. He's a junior, and they're working with a nonprofit organization, and they're learning how to identify signs of suicide in their fellow wow. students and friends. Yeah. And so they take this training and now they're going to take it into the classroom. They're going to go into schools and they're going to educate their peers on signs to look for and how to help if they do see their, their fellow students exhibiting those warning signs. Because think about it, who is better equipped to have a conversation yeah. in order to identify some those signs than their friends? And who yeah. are they most likely to talk to? Yeah. And so their goal really is to help one, like I said, normalize the conversation and reduce that stigma that you were talking about mm -hmm. around uh, mental health and suicide in, in particular. And then they're going to help get their friends to resources um, so that they can help get better and get the access that they need. So you know, again, incredibly powerful, the work that they can do at the community grassroots level. Yeah. Wow. I love that example. Yeah. It's, and it's super timely, you know, really to, yeah. to hear that. Um, and then of course there's all the funding and investment that's coming from the private sector as well. Yeah. 
uh, venture capital and private equity firms have been flowing money in for the last several years and everything from wellness apps to online platforms um, to brick and mortar locations. You know, as we mentioned, I'm working for uh, an organization that is in the virtual space for mental health. And I'm really excited about the opportunities there because I'm seeing a lot of organizations really become more consumer focused and mm -hmm. try to make healthcare, mental health care, both accessible, but easy to talk about and easy to, um, to find a resource that's going to help you. Uh, in, in a very consumer oriented way, which is not what we're used to seeing in healthcare. Right, <laughs> right. Yeah. We're, we're used to pretty poor patient experiences. So, would this be something where if I'm an employee of an organization, your company would partner with my organization to provide that mental health service platform, which could include a combination of kind of the virtual experience? Plus, is there any sort of live component that goes yeah. along with the, the solution, or how does that work? Yeah, absolutely. So the first thing that we do is we actually go work with insurers. We want to make sure that we are in network and we're taking insurance, which I think really helps resolve the first access problem that a lot of people have um, and affordability, right? So that you're only paying a copay instead of a, a couple hundred dollars for every visit. So we do that work. And then we also spend a lot of time partnering with uh, health systems um, to identify patients that would benefit from mental health resources, as well as to your point, employer groups, large employer groups will talk with them about um, making our services available to their employee population that, you know, is covered by the insurance that we use. Um, and we are 95% virtual today with therapy. We also do some medication management, psychiatry, medication management in particular. Um, and working actively to go to all 50 states by the end of this year. So really expanding quickly so that we can get those resources available. That is so exciting. So when it, I mean, technology clearly is helping advance and accelerate services and access to care. What are some other opportunities as it relates to technology that you see um, in the healthcare space and mental health in particular? Yeah, I, I do think that this is a space that, is very conducive to technology. Um, to go a little bit further on, you know, the the platform that we have, you know, a patient can go into our website. They can search on four hundred and fifty thousand different parameters to find a therapist that meets their needs, um, and then get scheduled for an appointment within three business days. Um, all done in 10 minutes, you know, from the, from the comfort of their home. And then they can do that appointment from their home as well, which I think is a huge benefit for a lot of people not having to leave to go to an appointment um, and then, you know, spend that extra time commuting. Uh, and so just being able to have the privacy um, is really helpful for them. And so mental health definitely is a space where I think technology uh, is, is booming. The telehealth space is really booming in, in our part of the industry. Um, and, you know, excited to see other parts of healthcare also moving in that direction, like in the pharmacy space, pharmacy solutions becoming more consumer oriented, where you can start to to shop around for your medications and find a lower cost option somewhere. You know, that's another kind of consumer experience that I'm seeing start to emerge. Um, I do think though, a lot of times you'll see young organizations jump into healthcare that are maybe consumer and tech focused first and healthcare focused second. And many of them struggle because they just don't have that bench strength of healthcare expertise to understand the complexities of the regulatory environment that they're working within. I mean, right. we only need to look back a few years to the uh, Haven Healthcare example, which mm -hmm. was that group um, formed by Amazon, JP Morgan, and Berkshire Hathaway, where they really wanted to provide their employees and families with this simplified and transparent healthcare experience. That organization really only lasted a couple of years. Um, they brought in a COO from the digital health tech sector and uh, you know, really struggled to make it a viable product. So 
I think there's the balance, right? You, you want right. to make it consumer oriented and you want to have that kind of um, platform and you need to have some level of healthcare expertise within the organization too that can help you avoid the pitfalls. Right. Yeah. No, that's a great example. And, you know, as you were describing that too, it made me think about the impetus for change and what's driving some of these changes as well. And in some cases, it's technology advancements. In some cases, it's consumer needs. Um, but, you know, some of this change that has happened in the healthcare space for, for I don't want to say for better or for worse, but that's the words that are coming to mind. The pandemic really did push a lot of this forward for, you know, you mentioned telehealth. That was something when you and I were working in the same health care organization was as far off, you know, we were, we'd get there eventually idea. And because of what, you know, that required of us to implement, now we've got all these benefits of telehealth and, and, and care being online. And, uh, you know, so that was an impetus for change. Are there other change drivers here uh, that, that we haven't talked about that are really pushing and propelling healthcare forward, whether it's mental health or healthcare in general, are there things that we, you know, should be aware of? Because to your point, understanding the healthcare landscape and having that bench strength is important. So if somebody's interested in getting into uh, healthcare, health tech, um, what are some of, what are some other change drivers that you're thinking about that your firm is thinking about as you kind of move forward into the next couple of years? Yeah, I mean, it's still along the technology vein, but of course, right. AI is the buzzword today, yeah. right? It's Everyone wants to know where AI is going to take us. And I think there is a great promise of it. I think there is a threat that you have to make sure that we're regulating it appropriately. Um, but definitely, there's, there's a lot to offer um, in healthcare and in other industries with AI as it it continues to evolve with its capabilities over the next couple of years and something to keep an eye on. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see where what AI does for us and how we learn how to work with it in the future. Right. Um, quick pivot on in terms of questions, because uh, you yeah. know, thinking about technology and early adopters and late adopters, do you find that even working in the technology space that inspiring and encouraging your fellow colleagues to accept and adopt a change? I mean. Do you see that early adopter, late adopter dynamic even within your own organization? Oh, within our organization, I think, you know, we tend to find people who are excited about technology and excited mm -hmm. about that, that kind of change. But I will definitely say, as I'm working with different healthcare organizations, there's differing levels of appetite for yeah. the virtual model, right? There are many who will say, I'm entirely comfortable. To your point, telehealth is here to stay. You know, I want to offer it to my patients. And then there are those that believe that, you know, they need, they have patients who need to be seen in person. And there are many patients who say that they still want to be seen in person too. Right. Um, but interestingly, I think, you know, there's a bias or a, there's a belief that the senior population needs to be in person and they don't understand technology. And right. I've been saying, for years, the senior population is not as senior as we think they are. Like they're yeah, pretty right. tight. That. <laughs> and so I, I actually think, you know, using my parents as an example, but seeing plenty of other seniors on their phones, they, they're plenty capable of using technology in the healthcare arena in this kind of situation or others. So Absolutely. I think there, that people are really moving down that continuum pretty easily. Yeah, I agree with you. And I think especially for certain types of, um, interactions with your healthcare provider. Mental health in particular seems like one where having something virtual is a is a great safe private space to you know have a really important conversation. Um, well, thank you so much. This has been really helpful and informative and I'm excited again to see where you take uh, you know your, your role and opportunity with PATH and, and what that you know what kind of innovations you bring to the healthcare space. Um, is there anything else that you would like to share with Apogee's community, with the Change Leader Insights community about um, how to enact change in the healthcare space? Yeah. You know, I always go back to my favorite change management tool, which is the stakeholder analysis. And so yeah. I think it's really about understanding who all of your stakeholders are, how they would react to the change and really just being thoughtful and planning about 
what that would look like before you just throw something out there. And so I think that's yeah. the biggest thing is to be thoughtful. Absolutely. And then having those informed conversations as a result of those, those insights. Tiffany, that is great. <laughs> yes. I mean, that is really part of it, right? That's a big part of it is making sure that people are there with you and they don't feel like the change is happening to them, but they're sort of co- co-creating the solution forward. Um, thank you again for your time today, for your wisdom. It was so nice to connect with you and hear about what you're doing and all of the opportunities that are coming down the pike as it relates to mental health services and healthcare innovation. Um, people can find you on LinkedIn. If you're uh, on LinkedIn, Tiffany Bray, I believe that's your handle, um, (laughs) on LinkedIn, but yes, again, thank you for being here. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. You as well. It's good to be here. All right. Thanks, Tiffany. Bye-bye.